um, at the TS and, and SCI levels, uh, the top secret and system compartment information levels. So basically the equivalency of what you're talking about is taking a bunch of individuals that don't want to help you. Say we have a problem with finances in, in the country, which we do, um, and you're going to take all these brilliant mathematics and economics kids and you're going to give them access to everybody's bank information and say, hey, make everybody wealthy. I think you'd find problems giving out personal information like that. Uh, and it, the analogy is very similar to what you do at these operational levels. So what you would have to do is you'd have to get all these thousands of people that you're talking about and get them up to be able to be trustworthy enough to be able to handle TSFCI information. But John, I, couldn't the but you're an ex-military veteran and you're a hacker and you're working at it. Wouldn't you be an ideal manager of such children? Um, well, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, it's all about uh, talk radio is all about hacking and managing personalities, and I think uh, some of your listeners got it right. Where uh, if you're going to do a selective selective service, uh, you need to be very selective on who you select. Uh, so you have to be a patriot. You have to be willing to handle information that is extremely sensitive. The whole concept behind top secret SCI information is that it is gravely serious if it was ever released to the public. Um, so absolutely, you want the best of the best in there, and should you go to people um, that have those skill sets and get those people? Absolutely. Uh, I think I don't think money is certainly an issue uh, as far as payment. Uh, one of uh, Benjamin mentioned that earlier. I think what you find, honestly, having been there, watched these things go live, been part of them, um, is honestly it's the bureaucracy and the legal aspects that these guys are fighting with one hand tied behind their back. Uh, oh, interesting. So, no, no, this is fascinating for me. I'm sitting here and learning. I, I'm absorbing like a child. But my overall idea of a selective, selective service, overall, I can see you're not 100% against it. No, only because you put us as a nation, as patriots, at such risk because of the, the systems that you have to give them access to. You're basically introducing a bunch of Snowdens. Um, and, uh, you know, Snowden was very intelligent. Um, but he was a detriment to our, our nation. Uh, and now, uh, that's a completely different topic. I'm not trying to... No, 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 you're making a... That's a very important point. How do we stop a Snowden from undermining the war effort if he was recruited, is what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Well, how do you stop it? There's a very simple answer to that, John, and that's with very severe punishment, like the death penalty if you wind up doing something against the war effort. Or let's say 25 years at San, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, I was going to say San Quentin. I didn't mean it. It's where they put one of our hero uh, army rangers who I helped get out of jail. They still gave him 10 years. It was shocking. An ex Marine who did his job in, in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq was put into, uh, Fort Leavenworth by George Bush for doing his job a little too well. I mean, nobody wants to go to Fort Leavenworth for, for 10 years. No, but I mean, you've mentioned it, you, you hit it right on the head. We're not enforcing the law. People like Snowden, who are, are treasonous and, and they're traitors, uh, we're not enforcing it. And, and we're just kind of brushing it over. And, and we got individuals on both sides of the aisle that sit in the political realm um, that we have laws in the books that do a lot of great things. If we just enforce the laws... John, listen, you know and I know the tide in this country is turning to conservatism, to patriotism, and national security. My three main themes on this show, I have always put national security ahead, ahead of every other issue for government and who I care about voting for, national security. It's why Trump is thriving. It's not because he's the most literate or articulate. He mangles sentences. He has no grammar. He doesn't complete a thought. I get all of that. But he is the only one who will bust heads that need to be busted. You know that, and I know that. I'm not denying that. <laughs> you know, there was a stupid interchange between him and Rubio. They asked about the triad in the in nuclear in world. You saw? Did you hear that one at all last night? I wasn't able to watch last night. I, I was all right, so it's like, Mr. Trump, well, what do you think about the triad, the nuclear triad? He didn't know the answer to that, and he stumbled on it. So Rubio jumped down his throat and acted like the smart little jerk that he is. He was all ready for that question. Well, it doesn't really matter whether Trump knew the answer to the question of how would he uh, deal with the nuclear triad. The answer was simple. He's the only one who hired the right people to handle it right and to destroy the enemy and bust their heads open and leave them bleeding in the desert. The thing is, is the people know that. 
They know that they have an alpha male who'll do the right thing to defend America, which is why he's surging in the polls. But let's go back to the cyber war that we're engaged in. You know the inside of it much better than I do. I know nothing about it. Why are we losing the cyber war against ISIS? Um, I'd say the primary reason is, um, is the bureaucracy and legal. Uh, the NSA, the National Security Agency, um, I had, know a lot of individuals that work there. Some of them are very good friends of mine. Some of them are even my family. Um, they, they are constantly priding themselves on being able to fight with one hand tied behind their back. And the, what, the problem there is because we are so, as a nation, um, we are so concerned about... Let, hold on, let me finish the sentence. So concerned with civil liberties. We are so concerned with civil liberties that we'll lose both our civility and our liberties. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a balancing act. When you, when you, yeah, well, it's time to get them off the seesaw. The same rules of engagement that Obama has imposed upon our fighting men. For example, jet pilots who were coming back and saying they couldn't even drop their bomb loads because a girl, one of the girls in the sorority told them not to drop the bombs on a target uh, in, in Iraq is that he might have some collateral damage. It's the same thing going on here. We're crippled. We are crippled from the communist mentality the top heavy bureaucracy that's been established long before Obama, but which has metastasized into a Frankenstein. Uh, what's your answer then? Well, I, I would say that the cyber war is absolutely probably the biggest, uh, most dangerous thing to our nation since the creation of the atomic bomb. And it, unfortunately, what, 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 what do you mean? You, the war that's being engaged, waged against us by the Arabs in ISIS? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying cybersecurity and cyber threats in general to our nation, whether it comes from China, whether it comes from ISIS, ISIL, whether it comes from uh, the insider threat, cybersecurity in general is probably our biggest detriment since the uh, creation of the atomic bomb. And the reason I say that is because um, cybersecurity isn't geographically located. Atomic bomb, you drop something on Nagasaki or Hiroshima, and it's located to that area. I can be in Russia and touch 12 nodes before I even touch your uh, computer that you're looking at right in front of you. But I can do so. How do I look? What do you think of my outfit uh, while I'm on the radio right now? I have four computers looking at me. <laughs> beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but this is I'm wearing a gray sweatsuit. I just ate lunch. Do I have any of the Indian food in my beard? Tell me. Can you see it in the screen? No, no. You're good. You got it all out. <laughs> no, I hear you. I understand. But you, but you, look what I've tapped into. Could you stay on the line? I want to talk about this because this is the most important subject I've ever handled in the history of talk radio. Please stay with me. Mr. Hacker, your name is John, uh, allegedly John, and you're calling allegedly from WMAL in Washington. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-BUY. Let me summarize what we are discussing on the Savage Nation, a selective, selective service. Meaning, how to win at cyber war, stopping ISIS and China and other domestic and national, international enemies through a selective, selective service which drafts computer experts into the military. That is the discussion. And I want to say something before we go back to the hacker John on WMAL. What you are listening to on this radio show today should be worth a fortune to individuals in our federal government at all levels. This discussion that we are having for free on the public airwaves across America is something that should be listened to in replay in every division of the U.S. military, if not other divisions of intelligence, if they haven't discussed it already. You're getting it for absolutely nothing free. And you say, well, you know, it's not worth anything. You're wrong. I can guarantee you that the government has paid fortunes to so-called consultants and experts who have given fewer ideas than I'm giving for free on this program today. John on WMAL, let's add to that discussion. Maybe we can educate the individuals in the bureaucracy. How would you win this war? Uh, oh, man, now you're asking uh, somebody with a five-pound brain to think at a 20-pound brain level. <laughs> no, stop it. You've been in the military for 10 years. You're a, a computer expert. 
You, you're a self-designated hacker. You have ideas on how to do this. You told me your hands are, are tied behind your back. You said you have relatives in the NSA whose hands are tied behind their back. Wouldn't the, one of the answers be to, let, to untie the other hand? Yeah, but by untying the other hand, it goes back to what we were talking about the other day. Because of the nature of cyber, the cyber world, um, when in, entities such as the NSA or the CSS or the United States Cyber, Com cyber Command um, cast these nets, out and to do their work, it's inevitable that the collateral damage that comes with it is U.S. persons. And so I see. they are very. So let me ask you this this U.S. Cyber Command, is it run by intelligent, really smart, really smart people? So the U.S. Cyber Command uh, was stood up by General Keith Alexander and uh, General Alexander. John, can you stay on the line and tell us what's not classified about the U.S. Cyber Command? When we come back, I really want to know, do we have smart people in there, or is it more of the same, basically, postmen in the military? This is the Savage Nation on a selective, selective service to win the cyber war. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Is Donald Trump a serious candidate? The reason I ask this is if you're going to close the Internet, realize, America, what that entails. That entails getting rid of the First Amendment, okay? It's no small feat. If you are going to kill right, stop right there. the He's wrong. family... Okay, Rand Paul is wrong. You see, this is the problem with zealots. A zealot gets locked into their doxy, and they can't think outside the constraints of their own doxy. It's like a religious fanatic, whether that religious fanatic be Islamic, Jewish, or Christian. If you get locked into a certain doxy and you can't think outside of that doxy, your mind is limited. You can't think. And right now, what you're hearing is the shrill voice of Rand Paul, who's locked into his doxy of libertarianism. I am saying that we have to stop thinking so rigidly and start thinking about uh, how to defeat the enemy rather than worrying about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin within our doxy. John and WMAL, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. So, John, you're now in charge of cybersecurity for America, and you're answering the American people at a Senate hearing on the Savage Nation. Is our cyber command the good one? Is it run by smart people? So the U.S. Cybercom is headed... Uh by currently um, dual-headed by uh, Admiral Michael Rogers. Uh, he is also the what's called Derns of the director of NSA. He basically wears two hats. Yeah, so I notice you're not saying any more. Is he, is he really smart at what he does? I, I would be lying if I, I could to speak to that just because I have never served under him. And I don't know. Well, John, John, are these people that smart in, in cyber warfare, or they're just bureaucrats who move their way up? So the individuals at what I would say the terminal level, the guy that sits in front of the computer, they are some of the best in the world. Um, I won't hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's good. Where, where do they get them from? Where do they come from? Most of them come from uh, places like you're talking about. The military, they, they recruit them. They bring them in from, you know, big-name companies. All sorts of places. Um, they they are. The so let me ask you something. That's very good news. Wouldn't it be better news for America if we heard that the great patriot Bill Gates, who gives away so many billions of his hard-earned money, or the genius Facebook creator Mark Zuckerberg, who's so in love with illegal aliens, wouldn't it be great if they gave a press conference and said, "We are going to recruit within our own company amongst our own uh, uh, staff." Members, we're gonna we're gonna do this for America. Here's what we're gonna do: we're gonna take some of our best people, and we're gonna give them the same salaries they're earning here if they go to work for the Department of Defense. They're not gonna lose one cent. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to wake up to one day? Yeah, absolutely. If they're actually recruiting and not mandating, uh, I think that's I think that's where my contention lies. Is, is I'm all for. I hear you. I very good point. The day is gonna come when they're gonna mandate, not recruit. 
The day is going to come, just as it did in World War II, once ISIS bombs a few more uh, child centers, a few more disability centers, once they blow up a few more people around the country, we're going to have a selective, selective service, and it's going to be required. It's not going to be optional. We are way past the point of optional, my friend. We're at war. We, they know it, but we don't know it. They're, they've been at war with us.